Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome back. We are almost done with the book What We Owe to Each Other by T.M. Uh, Scanlon. Only two chapters left and in this uh, video we'll go over his seventh chapter, Promises. In the previous chapter we talked about responsibility and how it fits in his contractualism, but a contractualist theory also needs to address the content of this chapter, Promises, since we cannot have a contractualist philosophy without asking the question what makes promises binding. Since breaking a promise is like breaking a contract or an agreement, we have to look at this issue. So, more broadly, a promise is like an agreement that both parties must respect. Now we can ask what is that precisely, what kind of obligation keeping a promise is, and why should it even be an obligation to keep a promise, and in what circumstances is you know that obligation binding. Now the first thing that Scanlon does in this uh, chapter is mentioning two philosophers, David Hume and John Rawls, who both have argued that what makes the obligation binding is that keeping a promise is simply a virtue. It is something that one ought to do because it is a good thing. But this is what we call an artificial virtue because it depends on a convention of agreement keeping. Uh, what this means is that in order for an agreement to be binding, it needs the existence of a convention of norms. We need that the members of a given society, uh, we need them to behave in a certain way, to have certain expectations and intentions, and accept certain principles as norms. Uh, so, so those norms would then uh, need to be respected by making it morally wrong for anyone to violate them. So basically, people agree with each other that these norms are valuable and once people agree on that they also need to agree on not violating them so they make the convention that violating those norms is morally bad because we've agreed that these norms cannot be violated because they are good so here we establish uh, the kind of you know uh, reactions of some sort of impartial uh, disapproval when the norms are violated. So if someone breaks a promise, it shows a lack of respect towards a norm and an institution that is working for everyone's interests, and that is something that everyone can agree on is wrong. And so that's how David Hume puts it. John Rawls, on the other hand, argues that um, promise breaking is bad because people benefit from promises. Society works in that way, it promises you social goods and it provides those goods for you but those goods were produced by efforts from other members of society and so by accepting those goods you have entered into a relationship with the other members who expect you now to contribute to the good that they are uh, that they are owed so by breaking a promise you kind of took the benefits without giving anything back to others uh, to those who provided those benefits in the the first place so Rawls argues that this would be unfair to those who did their part and responsibilities towards you and so in order to avoid that once someone promises something once i say i promise uh i promise something then i have uh accepted i have you know uh, bound myself to do certain things that i cannot refuse to do now and that now people are also expecting from me they are expecting me to do the things that i promised and so this means that when entering a promise people are now relying on me for doing something that is in their interests and so failing to do the thing uh, promised would lead them to suffer a cost that they thought because of my promise that they were safe from uh, and so this is the conception of a promise presented by another philosopher that uh, Scanlon mentions in a footnote, Neil uh, McCormick. And so Scanlon paraphrases his understanding of the promise as the obligation not to disappoint the expectations of others whom we have knowingly induced to rely upon us. But not everyone agrees with this. In the same footnote, Scanlon mentions another philosopher, uh, Joseph Ross, who argues that there are two things to distinguish when we talk about promises, and that's what he calls the intention conception of a promise and the obligation conception of a promise. The first one, the intention conception, basically says that what constitutes a promise under the right conditions, and we will see what those are later, uh, it's whether an agent through communication made, made explicit his intention to act in a certain way. Okay, so here I'm just stating my intention, right? But the other 
conception, the obligation conception, uh, expresses an intention to undertake the obligation to perform a certain, uh, a certain action. So just stating your intention to do something doesn't really mean that you have the intention of undertaking the obligation to perform what you, uh, what you said you were uh, going to do. And so for Scanlon, he is going to offer a view that is, you know, in the common ground between these uh, between these two views, uh, the view of uh, of Raz and also of McCormick. Uh, it's a view that is between the obligation not to disappoint the expectation of others and the view of, you know, the two conceptions of a promise. The view uh, that Skellen is going to be arguing for throughout this chapter is a view that holds that the concept of intention and the concept of obligation in Raz, for example, are actually an interdependent like you cannot really uh, really have one without uh, without the other as he says promises are distinguished by the fact that the intention expressed is supposed to be made credible by appeal to a shared conception of obligation by the grounds of uh, this obligation lie uh, by the grounds of this uh, obligation lie in a very in a principle very close to the one which McCormick states but the other thing that Skellen is also going to do is, um, is you know, he's going to question the role of uh, of conventions in normal uh, in uh, in making you know promises. Uh, he's not re really going to reject the idea that we need a convention or a practice to be able to make promises. He's just going to question their role in generating the obligation to keep one's promises. Because for Scanlon, the convention itself cannot explain why it, why it would be wrong for someone to break it. He just doesn't find it sufficient to say that because people rely uh, on you or because they suffer harm if you make a lying promise or don't keep, uh, or don't keep the the promise. Uh, these just take it for granted that it is bad without explaining why it is bad to break the uh, the promise. So the convention in itself is not sufficient. So instead, Scanlon will argue that breaking a promise is bad not based on the practices or conventions. Those are more like uh, tools to make the promise, so they are quite neutral. Rather, the wrongness of breaking a promise is associated with what we owe to each other, and Scanlon is going to argue that what we owe to each other doesn't really um, doesn't really rely on norms or conventions. Quote. I would argue, however, that the wrong of breaking a promise and the wrong of making a lying promise are instances of a more general family of moral wrongs which are concerned not with uh, social practices, but rather with what we owe to each other, uh, what, what we owe to other people when we have led them to form expectations about our future conduct. Social practices of argument making, of agreement making, sorry, when they exist, may provide the means for creating such expectations and hence for Commi uh, committing such wrongs, but I would argue that these practices play no essential role in explaining why these actions are wrongs. So how are we going to do that? Uh, well, let's imagine this case. Um, you are a guy in a state of nature. You are alone and you are hungry. You make a spear and go hunting. You spot a deer and you throw the spear at it, but you miss. and. Uh, and the deer, you know, now has, uh, has, has run away and your spear lands on the other side of a river that is way too deep and it, uh, and it has a very strong current and so you cannot swim to the other side to get your spear back. And so as you stand contemplating how to get back your spear, and let's suppose that the idea of making another one doesn't come to your mind, uh, you see that there is a sudden boomerang that lands near you. You look closely and you see that on the other side of the river there is another person and that person picks up your spear and he's puzzled and clearly he's looking for the boomerang. So you get this idea, uh, you get the idea that this guy can throw the spear back to your side of the river if you send his boomerang back. But for you to get the spear back you need that this other person forms a specific belief, which is, if I want that guy to give me back my boomerang, I have to give him back his spear. So this is a belief about an expectation to have if uh, someone does a specific task, right? Like, I get the spear and I expect the boomerang, all right? 
uh, I mean, I give, sorry, I give the spear and I expect the boomerang, right? So I do the task of giving back the spear and I have the expectation that I will get the boomerang by doing that, uh, that task. So let's suppose that you are successful and the guy forms that belief and he throws the spear back to you and you take it and there you just walk back with it into the woods and you leave the boomerang where it, where, where it landed. And so the guy on the other side of the river doesn't get his boomerang back but you got your spear back. Now, Scannon argues that the intuitive response to this scenario is that you did something wrong. And that is something that is akin to breaking a promise, even though no promise was actually made. All you did was just uh, making the guy form a belief in his uh, in his head, without you know you making any explicit you know promise. Uh, uh, you didn't co communicate any any promise, but yet there is something that is you know wrong with this uh, with this scenario. Like it's you kind of did something wrong that is like breaking a promise. And in this scenario, there is no special convention of agreement making uh, here. So, so that would prove Scanlon, Scanlon, uh, Scanlon's point. But someone can disagree with Scanlon, and Scanlon anticipates this. Uh, one can say that if the person believed that I'm going to throw back their boomerang, if they throw my spear back to me, then it means that a convention of agreement uh, making is presupposed. Because otherwise, what reason can there be for the, for, for the stranger to believe that I will give him his boomerang uh, back if he gives me my, uh, my spear? Because to be able to form a belief about a conditional intention means that there is a convention that links these two propositions together. The proposition, I throw the spear, and the proposition, I get back my, uh, my boomerang, needs a convention to make them into one conditional uh, proposition. If I throw the spear, I get my boomerang. And it also presupposes that the other person, who is you know me in this scenario, is also aware of this practice. If I have that convention but the other person doesn't have it, then it would be unreasonable to throw the spear back without checking if the other person who has my boomerang also shares this convention. Without that convention, I'll have no obligation to throw the boomerang back uh, back to the guy who threw the spear uh, the spear to me. So. If there was no convention, then it means that me walking away uh, from from the boomerang uh, and leaving it where it fell uh, is not is not wrong. Or if uh, or if the other guy thought that I would have another reason besides a sense of obligation to throw back the boomerang, then giving that this reason is not an obligation. Like I, maybe I, I can have another. Maybe I can have a reason to give him back his boomerang, but if that reason is not an obligation, then I have done nothing wrong either. Or at least not something wrong in the same way that broken, uh, breaking a, a promise is. And so Skellert, he formulates this obligation by saying, if the reason he attributes to me has nothing to do with the thought that I will be moved by a sense of obligation, it may seem that what I have done could not be the same kind of wrong as that involved in breaking a promise. So maybe I did something wrong, but even in that scenario, it's not the same thing as the wrong that is produced when someone breaks a promise. But Skeller disagrees with this objection. He believes that it is the same kind of wrong as breaking a promise. And he gives another example to, to better illustrate this. So he says, imagine that this time we are not in a state of nature, but we have a situation between two farmers. Okay, so I'm a farmer and you are a, far a farmer and uh, we both own a piece of land and these two lands are uh, adjacent. Uh, we both have a river that runs through our land, but the river overflows quite often and so when it does, it floods uh, both our lands. So I decide to build up the banks of my stream in order to protect myself from the overflowing. But I cannot do it alone and so I am going to ask for your help. But how can I convince you to help me? Well, I can lead you to think that if you help me, then I will help you to build up the banks of your stream. I can persuade you by either telling you that it is in my interests to help you back, 
or because I'm a grateful person who always returns the favor out of gratitude, or because I'm a devout, uh, I'm a de devoted member of some sort of sect or religious or secret society, and by swearing on the honor of uh, of me as a member, uh, I show you that I mean I really mean to help you uh, to help you back. Or maybe I show you that I am a Kantian philosopher and I make you a promise that binds me by some sort of uh, categorical imperative that I have to, uh, to abide to. But in all of these cases, I can be lying. In reality, maybe my reasons are purely cynical. I just wanted you to help me build up my banks and I had no intentions of helping you back. In all of these cases, I have actively misled you to help me and therefore for Scanlon, I committed a wrong which he calls an unjustified manipulation. And Skellen puts forth the following principle that would forbid any manipulation of that kind, and he calls it the principle M, and it states, in the absence of a special justification, it is not permissible for one person A in order to get another person B to do some act X, which A wants B to do and which B is morally free to do or not do, but would otherwise not do, to lead B to expect that if he does uh, X, then A uh, do uh, then A will do Y, which B wants, but believes that A will do uh, will otherwise not do, when in fact A has no intention of doing Y if B does X, and A can reasonably foresee that B will suffer a significant loss if he or she does X, and A does not reciprocate by doing Y. So. Uh, basically, uh, it's kind of it's kind of complicated how he how he puts it, but basically, if uh, if I try to get you to if if I if to get you to help me, I lead you to expect that I will help you back, but I had no intention to help you back, and I can foresee that you will suffer significant loss if I don't help you back. Then it is wrong for me to ask for your help. All right. So if I ask for your help and I will lead you to, to expect that I will help you back, but I had no intention of helping you back uh, and I can foresee that you will suffer a lot because of that, then it is wrong if I ask for your help. So this principle offers protection against unjust uh, or unjustified manipulation and we can hardly see any reason to reject it since it stems from a generic reason that we all would want to have. I mean, no one wants to be manipulated uh, on, uh, without, without any justification. The principle also leaves room for cases in which manipulation can be justified, but that would depend on the reasons the person the person would present, and this uh, this is what we called in chapter in chapter five, if you remember, open open ended principles. Uh, we can think of cases in which someone had to manipulate someone else in order to save someone's life, for example, if someone is in danger, but the person who can save them wouldn't do it only in exchange of some benefits, we can be justified in misleading this person. We can lie to them if that means saving the person who is in, uh, in danger. We can also think of cases of kidnapping, for example, or when someone holds uh, a person hostage. We can mislead them into believing we will give them something in return of letting the hostages go. Uh, other examples are paternalistic cases where maybe someone doesn't have the cognitive ability to understand rational speech. We can perhaps manipulate them to get them to do the things that, that are in their own good. Uh, parents do that all the time with their kids. Uh, they can promise you that they will take you to Disneyland, for example, if you take your medicine when you are sick. Um, there are also cases where both parties accept to be deceived, such as, for example, during card games. Uh, in regard to what we said earlier about conventions being uh, not sufficient, um, not sufficient to uh, to be the basis on which we say it's uh, it's wrong when a promise is broken. That is because what makes breaking a promise wrong is not the convention, but the violation of a principle like M. And M doesn't depend on a convention or a practice for agreement making to exist. Conventions and practices are more about what makes a, pra uh, a practice into a game, for example, or what is appropriate to say to a child from a parent, etc. These simply allow the principle to be concrete. You know, it's like you're, uh, the conventions are just here to, uh, to replace, you know, X and Y with concrete, uh, with concrete rules. 
uh, like it is the frame in which the principle can apply. But the principle itself doesn't rely on agreement to be effective. Since it cannot be rejected on reasonable grounds, the principle is already effective even though there was no explicit agreement between the two parties about the principle itself. Like, when I make a promise to someone, I don't go like, do you agree on principle M? And then we make the promise. You know, the principle is already presupposed when, you know, you make you know, when you make a promise or, or when you uh, lead someone to expect something in return. You know, uh, it can be invalid only if someone comes up with a reason why to reject it. But there is a problem there. If I know that you are a uh, that you that that we are in a case in which the principle doesn't apply, and I have reasons for rejecting that principle, but I don't tell you about them, so you are going on with applying the principle M, and therefore you have formulated expectations about what I have to do in return. But I, however, uh, don't do any of that, and so you blame me for breaking the promise, and at that point. I revealed to you that I had that I, that I had a lot of good reasons to reject the principle M, but you have already suffered a loss. So you tell me that I should have warned you that the principle M doesn't apply in our case. And so this doesn't mean that M is conventional, but that M isn't the only principle that applies regarding promises. And so Scanlon mentions other principles that can be applied in this situation to avoid making an agent pay a cost that they could have avoided. And so you can say that this is another principle and it's called the principle of due care or the principle D, which states one must exercise due care not to lead others to form reasonable but false expectations about what one will do when one has good reason to believe that they would suffer significant loss as a result of relying on these expectations. So here it says that if I can suspect that you will form expectations that I know uh, want uh, that, I, that I know that I won't fulfill them, that I will not fulfill them, then I have the duty to warn you that uh, to warn you about that, right? So if I saw that you had good reasons to apply M in the situation in which I had good reasons to reject M, and that means that I knew that you would suffer some great loss if I don't fulfill those expectations, that I have to tell you before we make the promise about my reasons for not abiding by M, or at least the reasons for why we can, in this particular situation, reject the principle M. But this principle, the principle D, seems a little bit vague. Like, I have to be careful not to lead others to form false expectations, all right? But what do we mean here by being careful? At least, you know, M has the advantage of specifying the kind of actions to which it applies, but D doesn't specify that at all. It just says, be careful without specifying the nature or even the extent of that care, right? So another principle has to be more specific and, and, and we can apply it here, which uh, Skellen calls the principle for loss uh, prevention. Uh, of, loss, uh, of loss prevention, and it's uh, called the principle L. It states, if one has intentionally or neglig uh, negligently uh, led someone to expect that one is going to follow a certain course of action X, and one has good reason to believe that that person will suffer significant loss as a result of this expectation, if one does not follow X, then one must take uh, reasonable steps to prevent that loss. So here, the idea of care is more concrete. It simply applies when I'm aware that you will suffer a significant loss because of the expectation that you form. So in this case, um, the case of the state of nature, show that I acted badly uh, if I knew, if I had good reasons to believe that by forming the expectations that I will give back the boomerang to you and you will suffer significant loss, uh, a significant cost, uh, if, I don't, if I don't do that. You know, if I don't give you back the boomerang, you will suffer you know, some, uh, some, uh, some cost. And if I knew that and I don't give back the boomerang, then I did something wrong. And so it's the same case with the farmers. If I had good reasons to believe that you will suffer if I don't reciprocate the favor, if I don't uh, help you, uh, help you uh, building up your 
banks, then not helping you back is a dick move. But this only applies if I had good reasons to believe that. Uh, that would be, you know, the extent of my care, you know. But that doesn't mean that if I didn't know when I obviously uh, could have uh, could have known that you will suffer great, uh, great loss, you cannot blame me. If I fail to see a reason to believe that you will suffer a harm because I didn't care, for example, I would still violate the principle. But we will see the problem of L in the next section. For now, we can agree that L offers greater assurance than D and M. It states that if I am aware that you will suffer some loss, I have to take reasonable steps to prevent that loss or at least to warn you. These steps can take a variety of forms. It can be a warning that uh, I won't do the action you expect of me or by offering a compensation uh, for that loss. And by compensation, Scanlon means a thing, uh, it means it means two things uh, in, a, in a footnote. He says, either the level of compensation required to make the person as well off as he or she would have been without having so relied, or the level of compensation required to make the person as well off as he or she would have been as a result of this reliance if the other party had performed as he expected. So basically, I either restore you to the state you were, uh, you were in before the loss, uh, occurred before you suffered the loss or I make you well off through uh, not the action that I that, that I promised or the action that you expected of me but of an equivalent that brings you to the state in which you uh, you would have been if I uh, if I performed the action expected and so such principle is also very difficult to reject because uh, it does offer valid grounds for generic reasons that everyone would want. No one wants to suffer loss because they relied on someone, right? So people must be aware of the kind of loss others will experience if they form some sort of expectation. Uh, we cannot have the luxury of neglecting that awareness. As Kellen says, it is not unreasonable to refuse to grant others the freedom to ignore the losses caused by the expectations they intentionally or neg uh, negligently led others to form. But uh, it is left open what the compensation, the fulfillment of action, or the warning will look like. Those are the parts that rely on conventions. And so the principle is neutral in relation to them. What the principle isn't neutral towards is the act of promising and fulfilling a promise. So what this means is that, as Kellen puts it, the central concern of, mora of the morality of promises is therefore with the obligation to perform. The idea of compensation is, uh, is of at most secondary interest. So what this means is that in the case of making a promise, there is no third party that is impartial and has the power to enforce the promises agreement. Promises aren't really, you know, contracts since they don't have a legal framework. Breaking a promise is a matter of the people who made the promise to each other. Uh, there are no judges, no lawyers involved, no authority, no third parties. So what matters for the principles M, D, and L is not that a, comp uh, a compensation or fulfillment or a warning is guaranteed. What matters is the obligation to perform the promised action. It is good that uh, that after you promise to drive me to work, you warn me that you uh, that you won't do it uh, the day before, uh, or that you uh, the, or that you pay a compensation if you can. But the issue is that uh, is that you know what's the normative force of a promise. The issue is what can drive us to respect and do, uh, and uh, you know abide to the obligation that comes with. A promise. Or as Kellen says, so in order to explain the obligations arising from promises, it will be necessary to move beyond the principle L to a principle stating a duty specifically to fulfill the expectations one has created under certain conditions. And so we can ask the question, what would that principle look like? So to recap, the issue with uh, the principle L is that it only offers a warning. It says that as long as I warned you that I won't drive you, for example, I don't have any obligation to drive you anymore. And it, it, here's a case uh, that really shows the limits of this principle. Suppose that you went to a party in which you found an 
an old friend, let's call him uh, Harold, and you didn't see uh, that friend for years. Now, Harold did something, uh, something many years ago, it's something that is bad, but it's not really that bad, but he's grown very sensitive about it, and it is something that he's ashamed of and embarrassed about, and it has, you know, it has been eating, uh, eating him up uh, ever since, and he never spoke about it to anyone. So suppose that during that party he tells you about it and he makes you promise not to reveal it to others. You have now two reasons at least not to tell the secret. First, you'd be gratuitously uh, hurting Harold and second, you'd be violating an obligation to him. And so in this situation, the principal ad is kind of worthless because it means that as long as you warn Herald that you will reveal his secret, for example, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, the rationale behind it is that when uh, when you warn someone, then they'll not be surprised. Uh, they will not be hit by surprise, let's say, because they, they, they prepare themselves. They would take a minimum of precautions to either avoid or minimize the damage that they'll suffer. Uh, but clearly this is bullshit because, at least in the situation, because here, uh, well, Harold first has no means to protect himself against that damage. Even if, let's say, uh, you were just going to stay in town for two weeks and you didn't reveal the secret for 13 days, but then on the, 14, uh, on the, on the 14th day uh, in the morning you tell Harold that you are going to reveal the secret, you can just say, well, I gave him 13 days uh, free from worry, so I, I held on to the promise long enough to break it, right? Um, and. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the problem with this isn't that it is a dick move, I mean, it clearly is, but there's another reason why this is not okay, and it's because of what Scannon calls the value of assurance. Um, the point of a promise is to provide assurance to us, but not an assurance that we will, um, that our mind will be free from worry, or that we will sleep better at night, or something like that. Uh, rather, uh, it's the assurance that actions will be done, or in the case of Harold, that the action will not be done. Uh, and, and so that's, that's the point of the promise. But here someone can say, well, that's just the interests of the promises. What about the promisers? You know, like if I, uh, if, if it makes sense that the promisee has interests in the promise, like to have the assurance, uh, Harold, uh, Harold is the promisee here. He has interest in the promise because it keeps, uh, you know, it, keep, it keeps his secret safe. Um, but then it wouldn't make sense that the promisee has reasons to have that promise, but the promiser has no reason to keep that promise, right? So, uh, like, since the assurance is about an action being done or not done, then both the promisee and the promiser, they must, uh, they both must have reasons to want that action to happen. The promiser too must have reasons to do the action involved in the promise, and. Skellen thinks that this is what would uh, give promises their obligation force, that we have reasons to keep the promise and that we owe those reasons to others. So for Skellen, the principle that we are looking for is one about the fidelity to uh, performance, not of compensation or warning, even if the warning was given before any action was taken. Uh, we want a guarantee that the action will be performed, and therefore the principle uh, will find its force in the reasons we have when we make a promise. And so this principle, which Scannon calls Principle F, F for fidelity, uh, has six points. Quote, Principle F, so it is, if one, A voluntarily and intentionally leads B to expect that A will do X, unless B consents to A's not doing so, two, uh, a knows that B wants to be assured of this. 3A acts with the aim of providing this assurance and has good reason to believe that he or she has done so. 4. B knows that A has the belief and intentions just described. 5A intends for B to know this and knows that B uh, does know it. And 6. Uh, B knows that A has this knowledge and intent, then in the absence of a, justific a special justification, A must do X unless B consents to X not being, uh, not being done. So, in the case of Harold, you had the intention of leading Harold to expect that you will not tell the secret unless Harold gives you, uh, <clears throat> gives you permission to reveal it. You knew, uh, you knew that Harold wants you to keep the secret, and so by keeping the secret, you provide assurance for Harold and give him good reason to believe that you are keeping the 
promise uh, that you are keeping the, uh, the secret. If, for example, you are being too reckless at parties by making private jokes about it that you know or hope that only you and, Her and Harold would get, that can make Harold question whether or not you are actually capable of holding your tongue, right? So Harold has to know that you have the belief and intentions that Harold wants you to have and you want Harold to know that you have them and that you want Harold to know that you are aware that he wants you to have them, right? And so, because you both know all of this, unless you can provide special justification that makes the promise non-binding, you must keep the secret. Now, there is a word that was used in uh, the description of principle F and that I didn't, you know, use in in the case of Harold, and that word is voluntarily, you know. And I kept that word away uh, from this example because, I mean, Scanlon himself thinks that there are some problems with that word, like he uh, put it there because when you perform all of those actions voluntarily, it gives more assurance that you will keep the promise, but it is worth noting that when making a promise has to be uh, voluntary, uh, voluntarily, like if you promise something involuntarily, uh, if you make it like an, an, uh, an essential condition that the promise must be done voluntarily, then the promise uh, the, the, uh, the promise won't be binding because it would be too limiting. Um, I mean, as we already explained in the previous chapter, doing something involuntarily doesn't make you immune to moral criticism, right? And so, here too, making a promise involuntarily doesn't mean that the promise is not, uh, is not binding. So the implication would be that you have always to tell people that you what you intend to do because you cannot do anything without their permission. When you uh, can only make a promise voluntarily, everything that you intend to do, you must tell the other person to see if they permit it. And so this can be too limiting and no one would make promises since we cannot always control what we do voluntarily or even involuntarily. And so that's why uh, it's better, I mean, rather to make uh, voluntariness the basis for a promise, it's better to just stick to reasons, which is the basis for uh, the principle F. You know, uh, the principle F holds that the primary motivation force for making promises is reasons, uh, the reasons of the promisers and the promises, rather than whether the promise was made voluntarily or involuntarily. As uh, Scannon himself says, principle F does not have this effect, however, since it applies only when A reasonably believes that B wants assurance, when A has acted with the aim of uh, giving this assurance and has reason to believe that he or she has given it. And when this is, and, uh, and when this uh, and other features of the situation are mutual knowledge. So, in this principle, saying that I made a promise involuntarily isn't good enough to reject the duty and obligation to do the promise, and so it serves as a strong and more realistic uh, basis for promise uh, making. In such circumstances, it is difficult to reject a principle that puts the basis of a promise on the reasons rather than voluntariness. Uh, when I have reasons to believe that Harold wants assurance that I will keep the secret, well, that is enough. You know, if I, uh, even if I didn't make the promise voluntarily, uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't matter because I have reasons to keep the secret whether I made the promise voluntarily or not. And of course, saying that I made a promise involuntarily can be a reason for not bearing the burden of a promise if the promise in question or the circumstances in which it, it was it was uh, it was made uh, make such reason a good reason uh, to make it non-binding. Okay, but the point is because it's about the reasons that I have for believing that Harold wants the assurance. Knowing this, it only makes sense if. Um, it only makes sense that uh, if I believe myself unable or if I doubt that I will carry out the action, I have to give a fair warning to Harold who also has to be careful before telling me about his, uh, his secret. Like, like uh, he, uh, he takes me outside and tells me that he has a secret he'd like to, to share with me before telling me what it is. You know, not knowing what the secret is, I have to warn Harold that depending on the secret, I may or may not keep it. Or if I know myself to be someone who is not reliable with secrets, I have to tell Harold before he make me promise. Or maybe I warn Harold that I might change my mind or something like that, you know. So in the absence of warning, the promiser cannot break a promise. 
but we can still find other situations in which a promise can be broken despite the absence of a warning. For example, if you promise to do something and then realize that it was illegal, for example. If Harold's secret was that he murdered or he raped someone, breaking you know, the promise would be justified. As Kellen says in a footnote, if the thing one has uh, promised to do would be improper or wrong, it may be that one should not uh, do it despite having promised to do so. This could be accounted for by the fact that the promisee's interest in having the thing done is not legitimate. In such cases, there, <clears throat> there, may, uh, there may remain an obligation or the kind specified by principle F to warn the promisee that one will not perform or if he has performed first to compensate by repaying the cost uh, of, that, uh, of that performance. So basically it depends on the circumstances and <clears throat> how those circumstances uh, form good reasons to keep a to keep or reject a promise. Uh, like for example, I can I can ask was I uh, was I manipulated? Uh, was I conscious uh, when I made that promise? For example, is the warning justified, etc. All of these would depend on our reasons for believing that the other has reasons to make the promise and stick to it. It depends on uh, it depends whether we believe that we have reason to fulfill a duty or have rights to rely on the other person and not just go uh, go out, you know, on uh, on on a, on a him. So. Uh, but when everything is right to make a promise, like both promiser and promisee, uh, all the circumstances were, you know, were right, were appropriate, then both of them have a right and a duty. The promiser has a duty to perform since he has reasons for that, and the promisee has a right to rely on the performance since he has reasons for that as well. But if uh, reasons is what for Scanlon constitutes the force of promises, it means that both promiser and promisee believe that each one of them has reasons to want the promise to be fulfilled. The promiser obviously uh, know that the promisee has reasons to want the promise, like if I promise Harold that I will not tell his secret, then that's uh, his reason for making the promise. But what about, uh, what about the promisee? He has to believe that the promiser has reasons to keep his promise, right? And since it's uh, this belief that the promiser has a reason for keeping the promise that makes uh, the promisee agree to the promise, then we have to ask ourselves, what's this, uh, what's this promise? You know? Harold needs to, to believe that I have good reasons not to tell his secret. And this reason must be, uh, I mean, what's the reason? You know, what's this reason? Uh, rather than what's this promise, just, <laughs> just realize it. So what is the reason that the promiser has for keeping, you know, the, uh, the promise? Uh, you know, I mean, here, uh, Harold needs to know that I have a reason to keep uh, his secret. And this reason must be strong enough so that Harold is assured that I will not break the promise, right? So if Harold uh, holds, you know, my... Uh, my wife and kids as hostage, for example, then it's clear what reason I have for not telling his secrets. But that wouldn't be a promise, you know? In a promise, the promiser has reason to perform the act that don't have any, uh, let's say, coercive or uh, institutional uh, guarantee that the act will be performed. So uh, what is the guarantee uh, that I don't break the promise? What reason do I have and that Harold believes that I have for not betraying him? Or as Kenan puts it, when I promise to help, uh, when I promise to help you if you help me, what reasons are you supposed to think I have for doing what I say I will do? And so we can, we can think of reasons like I don't want to, uh, to suffer a uh, social sanction, for example. If I am part of a cult or an order, even if you don't know how much, uh, if, even if you don't know much about it, let's say, or uh, believe in it, you know that my membership to the cult or order is important to me. So if I swear on my honor as a member of, of that group, like on my uh, reindeer honor, uh, that I mean, let's uh, let's suppose that there is a an order of the reindeers, and I am part of that order. And I will and I will say, I promise on my reindeer honor. That can give you reason to believe that I have a reason not to break the promise. I don't want to break the code of my covenant or my cult or order or whatever. But not everyone is in a cult, 
and uh, that's a good thing and that would be too restrictive since we are basically relying on a social practice here to explain why a promise is binding and Scallon argues that we need something more general here he argues we need to look at morality itself he says this is, uh, this is that when I say, I promise to help you if you help me, the reason that I suggest to you that I will have for helping is my awareness of the fact that not to return your help would, under the circumstances, be wrong. Not just forbidden by some social practice, but morally wrong. So, F, uh, the principle F, allows us to form an uh, explanation to why we have reasons to, per to, to perform the act, uh, whatever code or, of honor we uh, follow. We can be a sentimentalist, we can be an economic uh, man or a member of the reindeer order, it doesn't matter. What matters is that breaking a promise when it is done in the right circumstances is morally wrong, period. And so let's see how that works. When I say I promise that I'll be there at 10 o'clock to help you or something like that, we, uh, we agree that you don't have to say I promise to actually promise, right? Uh, so I tell you, uh, so I just tell you that, you know, I tell you that I, I'll, be, I'll be there at, uh, at 10. And so what happened when I said that? Well, I claim that I have an intention. I intend to be there at 10 to help you. I also make it explicit that I want you to know that I have this intent. I want you to know that I intend on being here tomorrow at 10 to help you. And I make it sure that the truth of that claim matters to you. You know, it matters because if I don't show up at 10, you will suffer some loss that you'd have, that you'd have avoided if it weren't for that promise. So you rely on what I told you to know what to do next. You know, that matters to you, obviously. So, of course, as Kellen says in a footnote, having an intention to do X doesn't mean that you promise either as you, uh, as, you, uh, as, you, as you can say, quote, I firmly intend to do X, but I don't promise to, gives the kind of warning which makes principle F inapplicable and expresses the judgment that having given this warning, he or she is free to decide not to do X. So you can say that I intend to show at 10, but I don't promise to in the sense of maybe I can change my mind or you consider changing your mind as important enough to make you break the promise or simply because you're not sure of what will happen tomorrow. Maybe you're uh, expecting some things that you are unsure, uh, uh, unsure of and that can get in the way of fulfilling the promise. Like maybe you have someone to pick up at the, air, uh, at the airport but that uh, expression says that their plane will land later but they didn't confirm yet, etc. But suppose that you did promise okay here it becomes clear that i intentionally led you to believe that i will be here tomorrow you have good reasons for believing that i will show up and so this means that i have good reasons to believe that it would be wrong for me not to show up unless of course i can give you a good a pretty much good justification for not showing up and of course, having a good justification doesn't mean that it is enough, huh? but I also have to have the right way and, uh, and time to give you that justification. How and when I give that justification can also make a difference on the suffering that awaits you when I don't show up. So when all of these elements are gathered, we can say that the promise is obviously binding without the reliance on any social practice. All that is needed is, quote, to indicate my awareness of the nature of the situation and my regard for the general moral fact that it would be wrong for me to behave in a certain way. So this would provide the promisee with a reason to believe the promiser that he has a reason to perform the act. If I show to Harold that I am aware of the nature of the situation between us and that I take it seriously that telling his secret would be morally wrong, then Harold has reason to believe that I have a reason to keep the promise and fulfill my intention. And knowing that I intend to keep the promise gives Harold some assurance that I will keep the promise. And so this, according to Skellen, is enough to make a promise binding. Uh, and the assurance provided, sure, uh, a, certain, a certain fear of a social sanction can help, but it is not necessary. In the case of the fear of a social sanction, or any sanction for that matter, it would be 
easy to justify why one breaks a promise. They thought that they, are, that they can avoid the sanction. Uh, if what is binding me to a promise is that I'm scared of a sanction, then if I have reasons to believe that I can avoid the punishment, then I can break the promise. So trying to provide reasons for breaking promise when you formed the intention of fulfilling it and nothing you know, prevents you from doing so. Uh, however, that is just... Uh, that is just impossible to do. You cannot provide reasons for that. Uh, you cannot provide reasons or principles for that. But some can raise an objection here to uh, to Skellen on the ground that it uh, that his account has a fatal flaw of circularity. Again, there is another problem of circularity, and Skellen mentions Elizabeth Anscombe as a philosopher who raised this critique, and she makes the following circular schema. Uh, so imagine this, okay? When the promisee, Herald, has, uh, has reason to believe that I will fulfill my promise, I can say I promise to do X and that creates an obligation for me to do X. The obligation to do X makes it morally wrong not to do X, so this gives me reason, uh, the reason I need to do X. But this reason is the reason that led the promisee, Herald, to believe that I will fulfill my promise, that I, will, that I won't tell his, uh, his secret. So. This is a circle, you know, and the only way out, uh, way out uh, of it uh, is to rely on some non-moral value to serve as the reason that leads Harold or the promisee to believe that I will fulfill my promise. Like, the reason why he believes me uh, cannot be... Uh, I'm aware that breaking the promise is morally wrong, you know. Instead, the reason, uh, the reasons based on social practices seem to make more sense, you know. That I'm a sentimentalist, an economic man, or I belong to the reindeer, uh, the reindeer order or something. These provide non-moral reasons for you to believe that I won't betray you when we make the promise, right? But Skellen says that this objection is... Uh, is fallacious. Uh, I actually do have more reasons to keep the promise I made to Herald without falling in this circularity. Those reasons are the principles M, D, and L. Those principles, if you remember, basically state that it is wrong to make a lying promise. That in the case of where I uh, where I lead someone to uh, to believe that I will do X, but I don't intend to do X, and they'll suffer loss because of that, I commit a moral law, uh, a moral wrong uh, if I let them go uh, go on with it. You know, if I let them believe that I will do X when I didn't have the intention to do X. So Skellen gives the following two conditions to show that this um, that his account of promising isn't circular. He says, quote. A, I can give you good reason to believe that I am uh, attending to persuade you that I have the settled intentions, uh, intention of doing X if certain conditions obtain and that I believe that if you are uh, persuaded, the truth of this belief will be important to you. And B, I lead you to believe that I know and uh, take serious the fact that under the circumstances, it would be wrong of me to attempt unless I really had that intention. So. Uh, let's see this with the example of the farmers. If I give you good reasons to believe that I am, uh, I am uh, attempting to persuade you that I have the settled intention of helping you, setting up your, uh, your bank of the river if you help uh, with mine, and I believe that the truth uh, of this belief, uh, that I'll help you back if you help me, is important to you, and I show you that I am aware of what will happen to you if I don't fulfill the promise and take that knowledge very seriously, then I will not be able to justify my actions for not helping you. And therefore, it would be uh, morally wrong for me not to help because I won't be able to justify myself. And we've already seen the consequences of not being able to justify yourself. So in this scenario, there is no circularity and the reasons for keeping the promise is moral reasons. Okay? It's wrong to let you suffer harm that I cannot justify. So here, the reason that the promise uh, that the promiser, sorry, that the promiser offers to the promisee isn't the conclusion of, you know, the chain of actions, but its beginning. It's the principle that states that any principle that lets someone suffer without justification is rejectable. So I tell you that I don't want you to suffer because, uh, I don't want you to suffer because of me. Uh, 
and you know I don't want you to suffer because of me a harm that you that I cannot justify like that's you know my my intention for that intention to be carried out I need to have the intention of performing the task in question you know like if I have the intention of not letting you suffer a harm uh, because of me and, that, and I cannot justify that harm I also have the intention I mean I must have the intention of also performing the task uh, that, that, I, that I promised so I promise you that I will help you if you help me and so the obligation is created deductively you know I have laid down the conditions for my uh, for my you know for my promised uh, for my for the help that I promised and you will receive my help on the condition that I receive yours first I gave you my reason for believing that I take seriously those conditions and I won't betray them because I know that breaking them would be at odds with a principle that cannot reject uh, that, that, that I cannot reject on reasonable grounds so all the ingredients to make the promise and generate the obligation are gathered and none of them are uh, are are from a non-moral source of motivation or have a special obligation generating force of a social uh, of a social practice but since as we've said that the act of promising requires certain conditions it means that promising cannot be unconditional or absolute a promise isn't binding if the conditions in which it was made are coercive for example or deceitful um, and it cannot be binding either in the absolute sense meaning that I have to keep the promise no matter what costs it puts on on me or on my well-being or even on others um, one can say that these restrictions are rules of a social practice they are like a release form when you rent a house they prescribe what are the terms required for a promise to be binding uh, like in other words what is deceitful uh, what is a deceitful promise for one culture can be a genuine promise in another so if i believe that what makes a promise legit is what I, uh, is that is that i said i promise at the temple uh, at the temple honoring the god of promises another culture can say that such promise isn't binding if they don't believe in such deity um, instead they have another practice uh, to make their promises legitimate so each culture would have a general framework of promising like a form and it's up to the parties uh, to the parties involved to fill the blanks of that of that form when you rent a house you receive a release form that specifies the outline of you know uh, of the promise uh, or of the rent you just write your name the amount of rent money the date you rented the house etc um, it will then be uh, it will it will be then said that the social practice of a promise is what makes a promise binding but as canon says although this printed form account uh, for uh, account of the role of social practice of promising has a certain appeal it does not seem to me uh, to be correct for scanlon um, promising is not a practice with specific rules he argues in a footnote that he used that he used to see promises that way but thanks to uh, discussions with another philosopher christopher McMahon, he changed his mind for him when we are trying to outline the conditions for a promise to be valid we're not asking what our social practice uh, is here uh, like we're not asking about a social fact but rather we are asking if we are justified in raising an obligation like does the belief in the promised deity justify the obligation that comes with the promise we can clearly see that it's the case when we consider situations in which there is no utterance of the word I promise like I like I said before you don't need to say I promise for there to be a promise if in situation if in a situation uh, those words weren't produced but the thinking process about the legitimacy of an obligation was present then it is a promise like in uh, the state of nature example I made didn't promise the other guy his boomerang back but I had such obligation because I made the other person believe that I will give the boomerang uh, the boomerang back uh, whether there is a social practice or not it's not the, uh, the issue the issue is uh, in the, instead of a general morality that is you know beyond social practices since we are talking about obligations to do something at a certain cost if anything when social practices are involved they can mislead us about the nature of the cost like in the case of the deity of promises for example uh, I am an atheist and so when someone promises me something by saying I swear on the Quran that I would be there
here at 10 uh, at 10 a.m. tomorrow to help you. I don't go like, yeah, that's worthless because of my because in my social practice we don't bring in a lot to make a promise binding. Rather, what makes the promise binding is that the other person accepts to be there at 10 a.m. because of the cost of being there is acceptable and tolerable, you know? And that's what it's all about. What does it cost the promiser to fulfill their obligation? Not what social uh, practice would make the, uh, promise, uh, the promise binding. It doesn't matter for me that the other person swears on the Quran or by Zeus or on his children's life or, you know, cross, uh, cross my heart. These don't make the promiser abide to the obligation. Rather, it is the obligation it's that the obligation doesn't put an unreasonable burden on the promiser. Uh, like if I promise you to be there at 10 tomorrow, uh, what makes you know the obligation binding is that you know me being there tomorrow doesn't put that much of a burden on me, doesn't put an unreasonable burden on me, and that uh, I have no reason to reject the principle that puts uh, an obligation that doesn't cost much on, uh, on me. But the account that Scanlon is offering of what makes a promise uh, of what makes a promise has some problems, and Scanlon is aware of them. Uh, one of the issues is that since basically what makes a promise for Scanlon is that you created a belief about an expectation in a promise by promising something, then what would happen when the thing promised turned out to be not desired by the promise? Uh, example would be sentences like. I promise that if you give me five dollars, I won't break your fingers. Uh, this is what we call a threat promise, and clearly there's something wrong with it. But also clearly, principle F doesn't justify this, and promises of this kind don't generate any obligation since it wouldn't make sense for the recipient of such promises to want their promisers to be bound by it. Uh, what reason would a promisee have to want to give five dollars to someone else to avoid uh, to avoid you know some some pain when you have reasons to just avoid getting uh, hurt for no uh, for no cost right uh, these are not cases in which the promiser is a benefactor but it's mostly you know a bully whose reasons for being able to uh, bind themselves by this promise have no moral weight whatsoever. Um, however, the problem with F is that it assumes that if there is nothing desired by the promisee, then all undesired objects of promises uh, make those promises invalid. But as we just pointed out, what about, you know, when benefactors promise you a certain good that is, you know, maybe necessary, but you don't desire it, like when we promise uh, libertarians, for example, healthcare. Uh, a second problem, also related to the first one, is what would happen if there was no expectation formed by the promise? What if Harold, for example, didn't believe that you had the intention of keeping his secret? What happens then? Is the promise not binding? Like, do you have no obligation to keep the promise if Harold did not expect you to do so? Well, let's see a specific uh, case to answer that question. Uh, this is what Skellen calls the uh, uh, the profligate uh, pal case. Uh, this is when a friend is borrowing money from you and uh, and he, he he's also been borrowing, uh, borrowing uh, money from others for years and he is always promising to uh, to pay back but he never does. And at one point you and everyone else stop lending him money. And so the drama begins here. Uh, your friend realizes that no one respects or trusts him, uh, trusts him anymore. He realizes his, uh, you know, shame and humiliation, but he still needs the money. And so he starts to, to beg, promising that, he, uh, that he's changed and that he will return the money this time. And you see that he, that he is sincere in his intentions, like he really has the intention of, you know, bringing back, giving back the money this time. But still, even though he is sincere now, that doesn't mean that he will actually do that. So you don't believe him uh, I mean, you don't believe that he will return the money to you. Like, he, you believe that he has the intention, but you don't believe that he will actually do it. But out of pity, you accept to lend him some money. However, you also realize that lending him uh, the, the money out of, out of pity would be more disrespectful to him, uh, and it would be more humiliating too. Like, he's genuinely trying to be someone trustworthy and who, who will, uh, will pay you back. So you treat his uh, request 
seriously and not just out of pity. He, uh, he wants it to be a promise so that he can really prove to you that he had changed. Uh, so okay, you accept it, he promises you that he will return the money and uh, there the, the promise is made, you gave him some, uh, some more money. Now the question is, does he have to pay you back? I mean, you have no expectation that he will, since you gave him the loan, mostly out of charity and without expecting that you will receive a penny back. And so Scannon argues that giving the principal F and all the other principles, he doesn't have to. But intuitively, we kind of feel that he has to, to give you back the money. Now, Scannon doesn't argue whether uh, what we feel is right in, uh, I mean, I mean, is, is, I mean, what we feel intuitively is uh, is true here. Like he, he's not he's not arguing uh, arguing whether it is the case or not. We may be mistaken, and that in reality your friend doesn't have to pay you uh, to pay you back. Instead, uh, Scannon supposes that maybe it is the case that it is true and sees what that implies for this principle. So according to him, uh, this doesn't apply anything actually and it doesn't apply it applies nothing much even if your friend has the obligation to pay you back principle f isn't mistaken rather he says that these are impure cases which can be explained by f if we add supplementary principles to it like let's look at another uh, impurity cases uh, to understand why f is not mistaken scannon suggests that when we take the second clause of the principle that a wants b to be assured of something and in this scenario a will considers what uh, that what b wants to be assured of isn't in b's interests here a promiser doesn't have any reason to believe that doing x is in the promisee's interest we suppose that uh, uh, we're supposed to do that, we, that, that the promise didn't make it explicit that they want to be assured of that. In the example we just gave, since we don't have any interest in receiving the money, the second clause of the principle doesn't apply and so the, uh, the principle F itself doesn't, uh, doesn't really apply. Therefore, your friend doesn't have any obligation towards you. So even if your friend, who is the promiser, wants you, uh, wants to be bound in that, uh, in that way to the promise, since you don't have any interest in this, like you have no expectations to receive the money back, then your friend won't be, uh, wouldn't be able to think of a reason why they have that obligation. Uh, only when the promisee has an expectation, uh, F can apply. So if the promiser has reasons to think that the promisee wants X, this will give him uh, the uh, the promiser, the promiser, uh, it would give the promiser a reason to be bound in this way. It would be difficult indeed to reject the principle that says that when the promisee has an interest in the promise, the promiser doesn't have to be bound by the promise. So the only way maybe to reject uh, this would be uh, because of paternalism, uh, where you know the, the promiser becomes a caregiver to the promisee and decides what's in the promisee's interests. Like, imagine a mother who promises her daughter when she was young that she will give her a sewing machine. Like, at that time, the daughter and her mother had the same, the same values, and it meant a lot uh, to the mother that her daughter takes on sewing once she becomes an adult. But now, the daughter is an adult, but her interests have changed. She, is no, she no longer wants the machine, but her mother ignores this. She still has the belief that her daughter wants the machine that she promised her. Now, this would mean that either the mother will force the daughter into something that she no longer desires just because she promised or believes that it, that it is in her interest and so it's paternalism. And so neither, uh, uh, neither, you know, uh, neither, uh, neither positions would make sense. If the daughter doesn't want the sewing machine anymore, forcing her to have it because you promised her a sewing machine when she was a kid is, I mean, it's easily uh, rejectable. And likewise, assuming what's in her interests, we've already covered that the, the problems that it has uh, when we uh, talked about responsibility and the value of choice uh, in, uh, in the previous chapter. So likewise, if the mother learns that the values of the daughter have changed and she no longer desires the sewing machine, it would be strange that when the mother doesn't give this, uh, the machine to the daughter, uh, the daughter would respond, uh, would, would respond with, but you promised, you know? Uh, we would see this as, uh, as pretty as pretty is pretty weird i mean you no longer need the machine like why would you you know blame your mother for not getting giving you the uh, the machine 
And so this means that for the daughter, a promise is a promise no matter what. I mean, if she blames her, mo her mother, then for her, a promise is a promise in the absolute sense. And we, were, uh, and we have already ruled, uh, ruled, that, uh, ruled that out. Uh, in this case, F holds perfectly when the promisee doesn't have an interest in the promise. The promiser doesn't have any obligation anymore. And so by comparing this with the case of our friend uh, who... Uh, uh, who, uh, who, owe us, uh, who owe us money, uh, we see that the friend is in the same situation as the mother. He just falsely believed that he has an obligation, but we still intuitively feel like he does have an obligation, so what's up with that? Uh, Skeller argues that the obligation that he has towards us is not an obligation that comes from the promise, but from gratitude. Like, technically, you uh, misled him in forming an, uh, an expectation about what they, what's in your interests, but you do have an interest, uh, an interest in this. And your interest wasn't just the object of the promise, uh, it wasn't getting back the money, but it was helping your friend feel that he has done something right. Okay, so in reality, you offered him a gift that you uh, let him think it's a loan. Right? And that's why we feel that he has an obligation. As Kellen writes, this supports the intuition that it would be wrong for uh, wrong of the pal not to repay you if he can and makes it the case that this conclusion would remain true even if the nature of the situation become clear to him. Principle F requires supplementary supplementation here, but only by principles governing obligations of gratitude. So this means that when the promisee doesn't desire the object promise or no expectations were formed, there are no obligations that are generated from the promise uh, or from promise making, but it doesn't mean that there are no obligations of a different nature involved in those cases. So next, Kellen moves on to another section in which he is going to summarize his thoughts uh, so far. He says that there are three roles that we have that we can that we can think of that social practices play in promise making. First, he says it might be uh, it might serve as a mechanism for signaling our intentions and our understanding of the situation we are in. Second, it might serve as a source of motivation and hence as a ground for expectations about what others will do. Third, the moral standing of a practice might play a crucial role in generating the obligation to keep uh, particular agreements. But uh, we've seen that promise making doesn't rely on any of these uh, of these roles and therefore social practices are not necessary for making a promise what is necessary however are moral principles that justify obligation and which don't rely on social practices we have identified four principles so far m l d and f and uh, those align with contractualism and explain why we have the duties that we have in the case of making a promise. And that is because, quote, the duties we have are determined by asking what principles for the general regulation of behavior we would agree upon under, the, under certain conditions. So those conditions can sound like the social practices that we ruled out. So to avoid contradicting ourselves, we need a distinction between artificial and natural virtues. So the former relies on social practice and therefore duties that have this form of an artificial virtue are duties that arise from social uh, practice. These are like, you know, paying your taxes or contributing to social welfare, uh, not, not, not destroying public, uh, public goods, uh, be on jury duty, etc, etc. These would need an institution to uh, back them up because they enforce that people who have benefited from those goods don't abuse them or abuse those who contributing, uh, whose contribution maintain them. Uh, such, you know, rationale can also work for duties that arise from promises, that, beca that because you benefit from the promises' actions, you have a duty to keep the promise. But this is not the reason promises are binding. Moral duties that come from social practices are different from those that come from promises. Uh, they are generic, meaning that they are not uh, that they are not uh, owed to someone in particular, whereas the duties that I have uh, from a promise are owed to a specific individual who may or may not have contributed to the practice of promising. They also don't involve 
uh, impartial, uh, impartial third parties to enforce the promise, and their moral consequences are different than the ones involved with institutional duties. In other words, the conditions for making promises are not artificial, but natural. They rely on the natural virtues of the individuals and not uh, the artificial ones that are made out of social practices. Uh, promises, because they don't have institutional support, rely on the fact that individuals are aware of the moral wrong that, come, uh, that, that comes with uh, breaking them. So we rely on, on you know, people's goodness and reasonableness to keep promises. But in other cases, we don't need to know whether the individuals are reliable in, uh, in, that, matter, uh, in that manner, since there is an institution that guarantees those goods uh, independently of the character of individuals. But there's a problem. Someone can argue that keeping a promise is still an artificial virtue because it comes from a social practice. They that argue that since a promise is about assurance, and assurance is always relevant in specific circumstances, then it depends on the social practice of a society to determine if that assurance is given or not. Like in the case of the two farmers, the reason why they make that promise is because there is no institution that would guarantee that neither farmer will suffer from a river overflow. Uh, and so in a society where they have that assurance guaranteed by their institutions, they wouldn't have, uh, they wouldn't have needed to form the promise in the first place. So my promise are going to be determined by the social practices of my society, in a society in which all of the important uh, matters were made by people under the guise of an, uh, of an institution that, you know, assigns these uh, people specific roles and duties to perform, there won't be any promises anymore, since the assurance uh, they're supposed to provide will be given by the institutions, by the states or the governments or whatever. And so, if this is true, then moral obligation that rise from promises, uh, that, that arise from promises, sorry, are conventional. But this is mistaken, according to Skellen, because, quote, if this is correct, then not the validity of principle F, but its importance relative to other moral considerations will depend on, so, on social circumstances. And this might be regarded as a conventional element in my argument. Like he say, uh, like he's saying, true. The conditions for a promise change, and they are conditional. But as stated earlier, none of that would make the principles behind promises, meaning M, D, L, and F, conventional. The principles they still hold; they are still valid, even if we live in a world where we don't use those principles anymore. A world where everything we do is mediated by third parties, for example, uh, which I'm not sure is very is very desirable. But even if we exist in that world, the principles still hold; they are still true, nonetheless. So far, we've argued that what makes a promise binding is that we basically didn't manipulate or mislead someone to form expectations about our behavior that we know they had reasons to form and that we didn't do uh, what they expected us to do. So we can suppose that the duties arising from promises are the same as not telling lies, like my duty in a promise is to tell the truth. So in this next section, Skellen looks at the duties we have uh, from not lying and from telling the truth. He argues that these are different from the duties we have from promises. He starts by distinguishing between the generic, reason, uh, the generic reasons that shape our moral principles and the structure of those principles themselves. Let's start with the reasons. Now, what reasons do we have that bear connection to uh, to lies and truth. Now, from the point of view of someone who receives the information, the main reasons for uh, the main reason for wanting the truth is because they rely on accurate information to be able to act accordingly and to rely on other people, which is something that that we need. But the from the point of view of the provider of the information, it can be the other way around. They have more reasons to want to keep information for themselves because they want to protect their privacy uh, or maybe even to protect others if they are competing with uh, with someone uh, with someone else the information can be valuable and so they'll demand the exclusivity of that information etc whatever it is often the reasons that the provider has and those that the receiver has are in conflict 
So due to this conflict uh, regarding the value of information, we'll find two conflicting principles that if neither can be rejected, will be in a serious problem. He says, uh, reasons for the first kind are made uh, potential uh, reasons of the first kind make potential recipients want principles forbidding lying and even requiring the provision of useful information and reasons of the latter sort move uh, potential providers to reject or to at least to want to modify such principles. According to Scanlon, however, reasons of the first kind are easier to argue for than reasons of the second. Principles that forbid one to lie or mislead and manipulate others are more difficult to reject than ones, uh, than ones that give you the freedom to do so. And so such principles would be, uh, would be some broad gener generalizations of you know, the principle M. Scalen, and Scalen call, calls it the principle ML. Uh, he says, one may not, in the absence of special, ju special justification, act with the intention of misleading someone to form a false belief about some matter or with the aim of confirming a false belief he or she already holds. And it also extends to more uh, to more things than just uh, than just lying. Uh, actively misleading people without lying is also forbidden in this principle. When you lead someone to form a belief that you know is false, uh, it's false about you know uh, about someone else, for example, without saying uh, without saying anything false. Like you lead someone to form a belief that you know the belief is false about someone, but you didn't you didn't say anything false. Uh, to create that belief in the mind of, of another. Um, all you did uh, was, for example, saying vague or general things, that would still be a violation of this principle. So what the principle forbids is when you mislead people, which is what people who don't want to be, uh, to be lied to have in mind. Uh, the reason they oppose to lying is because lying would mislead them. So this principle can also work for information providers since it would uh, allow for the freedom to hide, lie or mislead others when one has special justification for that. So it seems, it seems like the principle works for both and cannot be rejected. But information providers may be, uh, I mean, maybe they can reject, uh, reject it uh, on the grounds that the principle is too broad. Like maybe that say that we cannot reject the principle when it's about straight up lying, but when it comes to competition, for example, I can mislead my opponent. Uh, we can say that's uh, that's covered by the uh, in absence uh, absence of special justification clause. But uh, special justifications are about uh, rare cases, uh, whereas competition is quite common. Uh, I was in a uh, I was in a competition doesn't require a special justification when you want to protect your privacy, that's not uh, a special justification either. So we either make an L admit that common things are also special justification, and so what makes those justifications special, uh, special anymore, or we just restrict an L to only lying and not misleading. But that's not how the principle works. Uh, protecting your privacy would rarely require that you violate an L, because it depends on why your privacy is threatened. If someone demands information which can violate your privacy, we ask what principle is that person relying on to make that demand. If the principle can be rejected, then you don't have to lose your privacy. And principles that can, uh, that cannot reject uh, and that can demand of you that you disclose information that can hurt your privacy are actually just a few ones. You know, they, uh, uh, there isn't many of them. So in the, case of, uh, in the case where you cannot reject a principle that demands that you give private information, but you, but you manage to have justification that makes an L overrule the other principle, then your justification is a special one and it is aligned with an L. Uh, cases of special justification are the same that we discussed with the principle M. Uh, there are four cases, like emergency cases, threat cases, paternalistic, uh, paternalistic cases, and permission cases. Uh, these are like 
when we talked about the case where you have to save someone from drowning, but that requires you uh, to trespass on someone's property who doesn't care if the, per the, if the other person drowns. This is, you know, an emergency, so if you can mislead them somehow to let you go to save the drowning, uh, the drowning person, then go ahead, you can mislead them. Uh, and it's the same with threats. When someone kidnaps someone and demands money, the police can lie or mislead them. Paternalistic cases include uh, also parents who lie to their kids for their own good, like when their pet die, for example, that'd be like uh, Snooky went to grandma's farm or something like that. Uh, in cases of permission, it depends on uh, it depends on what we are permitting, if uh, and if uh, and if it is worth considering it a special justification. Uh, these are the most difficult cases because what can be allowed if uh, it's not in the context of an emergency threat or paternalistic care to deceive uh, to deceive others uh, is not very is not very clear. You know, we can actually ask. I mean, if it is not an emergency, if it is not a threat, if it's not a paternalistic case, what can, you know, uh, what, what, what can be, what can be allowed to, uh, you know, to, to demand some information about privacy or stuff like that. Um, some form of competition maybe, but even there, Scanlon is skeptical if uh, you can justify deceiving people on the grounds of competition, even within an institutional uh, framework. Uh, it's, however, worth noting that principles against the act of lying are different from the principles for the act of telling the truth. Uh, ML simply argues that we cannot mislead others, but it doesn't say that you have to tell the truth. Okay, so can there be a principle that compels people to say the truth or to provide positive information? A uh, principle like these, uh, according to uh, Skellen, would work like principles for positive aid, like we've seen in the structure of contractualism. When you see someone about to suffer harm and you can make that uh, person avoid that harm, then you must intervene or that you have to put a positive value on aiding others, etc. Uh, Truth-telling can work in that way. Uh, like, you, like you have to tell the truth, it's a, it's a must. And although there are differences which makes truth-telling more advantageous in the, range of, in the range of activities that are called positive aids, like when there are many people who can provide help, it's tricky to select who should do it. Um, but in the case of truth-telling, it's often easier to single out who has to tell the truth, it's the person who has the information, and cases where only one person has the relevant information are more common than cases where only one person can provide some sort of physical aid. And second, because telling the truth uh, isn't a physical aid, it doesn't put much burden on individuals who are asked to do it. In that way, principles of telling the truth are harder to reject than other principles of positive aid that would require heavy burdens and difficult selection, right? So, um, this, however, uh, doesn't mean that telling the truth is free from burden or that the burden uh, that truth can put on the provider cannot be used as a reason to reject the principle. Uh, whatever burden it is, the principle needs to recognize, uh, to recognize it as special justification when it is appropriate. If I have to tell the truth to someone who will then destroy my reputation when the truth uh, wouldn't uh, wouldn't make much of a, of a difference in their in their life, for example. Like if Harold's secret was uh, that he did something bad to someone in high school, like a friend in high school was dating someone and that someone left them without, uh, without much reason, and it's because of Harold, for example. Suppose that person is now uh, powerful enough to make Harold's life miserable and is quite resent... Uh, and is a, a very resentful person, then Harold would be justified in deceiving this person for him, Telling the truth isn't worth it, you know? Indeed, since the principle here is about providing something in the context of aid, uh, if the truth isn't going to aid, then there is no need to provide it, and hence there is no obligation to give, uh, to tell the truth. Um, Skellen mentions uh, the philosopher Alan uh, Ryan uh, in a footnote who contrasts this with, uh, with doctors, uh, public officials, and politicians. The reason why we demand that these figures provide the truth is because the information that they provide is useful. That's why politicians are hated uh, so much there, because their lies have consequences on our rights for help and aid. Now, with this in mind, we can answer the question at the beginning of the section, does this correspond to the principles uh, governing promises? And the answer is, 
Not really. Uh, Scanlon argues that principles like NL do act as generalization of principles like M, uh, like M, D, and L, uh, which are principles about promises. Uh, I mean, Scanlon even mentions in a, foot, uh, in a footnote another philosopher, uh, Charles Fried, who emphasized this parallel, his, uh, this parallel between promises and lies. Uh, by saying uh, every lie is a broken promise. But as we've argued, M, D, and L don't cover fully the act of promise. Instead, it's uh, principle F that accounts fully to what's a promise, and unfortunately, M, L does not correspond to F. Uh, the point of F isn't limited to just don't mislead or uh, just to you have to tell the truth or give uh, a warning. It's about the assurance of uh, of performing the promised act. So promises are relevant only when there is doubt that the uh, that the action will be performed. Uh, if if I was certain that you will do X, I wouldn't have made you promise that you will do X. So to promise is to provide with a motive to do X. A reason for doing it will uh, that will uh, that will make sense to me and see that you have good reasons to do X. So that if you do not do it, we are both aware that you did something wrong. And this is what Skellen explains in a long footnote, uh, that it's because there is a strong moral prohibition against breaking a promise that a promise can be effective. Why would I give a loan to someone when I doubt that they will pay me back? It's because when well, breaking the promise is really bad. And so that's why making a lying promise whenever it suits your conveniences, according to, for example, Immanuel Kant, can never be a universal law, or even one in it to be a universal law. If it were universally permissible to make promises without intending to fulfill them, promises would lose their effectiveness as a means of obtaining money. Uh, here we see the difference with lying, because contrary to a promise, the efficiency of lies don't depend on a moral prohibition against lying, like it doesn't necessarily depend on the idea that those who tell them are constrained by a moral prohibition against lying. In the same footnote, Scanlon mentions uh, Christine uh, Korsgaard, who uh, I think that's how it is pronounced, who gives the following example. If a murderer, for example, shows up, uh, shows up at your doorstep uh, with the intention of killing you and asks if you are in the house, so they don't know that you know that they want to kill you, so you say, uh, no, he's not here. So in this scenario, even if we live in a Kantian universe where prohibition against lying is universal law, the lie would be effective. The murderer, uh, the murderer being unaware that he is in a situation where the law would apply, and since he thinks that his intentions are not known, he doesn't think that you'd have reasons to lie to him. So. In uh, the case of a promise, if there is a universal law that makes it okay to make lying promises, then what's the point of making promises since the doubt uh, that someone would not pay you back doesn't go away? The universal law would make promises lose their appeal, but in the case of lying, the universal law prohibiting them doesn't make them lose their appeal. And so this is what makes a promise a promise. It's because you believe that someone has the motive to do the act promised, a moral motive, of course. But the motive doesn't hold in cases of lying. That's why cases in which you have, uh, in which you make uh, someone promise you to tell the truth or not lie would be different from cases where someone simply has to tell the truth. In the case where uh, in the cases we've, uh, we've seen, while you have to tell the truth, your motives can be very different from ones involving in, uh, involved in, uh, in a promise. Uh, a doctor tells the truth for other uh, motives than, uh, than when a friend promises me to tell uh, the truth. A doctor can even tell the truth for other reasons than moral ones. Uh, kind of like, you know, Dr. House, uh, uh, you, know, you know the show, uh, it's about a doctor who always tells the truth to his patients because he sees them as puzzles to solve, and so he wants them to act in ways that the relevant information about the disease are not uh, are not hidden. It's not out of concern or anything like that. It's more like like he he, he always tells the truth uh, out of you know pragmatic uh, for pragmatic purposes. So we can conclude that obligations to tell the truth or not lie arise from other 
kind of obligations than the ones involved in promises. Now, we can say it's the same thing with, uh, with oaths. Uh, when I take an oath, it's uh, also to give some assurance to someone. So we can say that oaths get their sense of obligation like promises, right? Uh, they are compelled to say the truth and invoke something that they deeply value, uh, like uh, God, for example. Uh, an oath goes as follows. Like you say, I swear to you by God or, uh, uh, or any... Or, 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 some, or something else that uh, I will do X or whatever. So to invoke this authority, God, the Bible, uh, maybe a loved one, uh, is to show that one is sincere because if they weren't, it would be incompatible with their devotion to the something that they consider uh, valuable. And so this also explains why some people would even go as far as saying that even when they are sincere, you cannot evoke that authority in support of any claim. Like you don't take the Lord names, uh, the Lord's name in vain, even when what you said was sincere. If you use uh, the Lord's name for something trivial, it would downplay the value of God. And of course, if you uh, if you are a devout uh, believer, uh, you we can, you, you cannot have that. So when one makes an oath uh, because the authority they appeal to in their claim has this much value uh, would be you know convinced uh, by their sincerity but do oaths really really work like promises and to know that we can look at this case uh, Scanlon mentions the philosopher R.S. Downey I think that's how it is pronounced um, he gives this example of the uh, IRA the Irish Republican Army who forced uh, Protestants Protestants, uh, they captured Protestants and they forced them to swear by oath on the Bible not to provide information about them to the police. And they do that and so they are released by their captors and they go right to their, uh, to their church and they tell the story to their minister. Now their own minister tells them that they have to keep the promise because they swore on the Bible. Now would that promise be binding? Well, since it was extorted, the people who made the promise did it out of coercion. And so normally we wouldn't accept this as a binding promise. But if that's the case, then why the minister would tell the Protestants that they have to keep this, uh, this promise since they technically don't owe anything to the people to whom they made the promise, their captors. And so this would be a case where you were in an emergency uh, where misleading your captors would be justified. But that would be overlooking something crucial in the nature of an oath. Uh, two things, actually. First, oaths don't have to be moral, since many people would, uh, would make uh, oaths to carry either a moral or immoral things, like when someone takes an oath for revenge or to threaten uh, someone. In the case of a promise, once there is something immoral involved, uh, the promise is no longer binding. So if the oath makes you do something immoral, it's not really sufficient to say that you are not bind by it, because its, uh, its point isn't really morality, but something else. And this leads us to the second reason why oaths are different from promises. Um, Failing to keep a promise may be justified, but failing to keep an oath uh, cannot be justified because failure of carrying out the act will always betray weakness or cowardice from the part of the person who took the oath. That's because in such cases, the oath appeals to the individual's dignity or, you know, the individual's sense of honor uh, or integrity. And here, uh, Skellen mentions Adam Smith, and uh, Smith is uh, I mean, he's known for his uh, book, uh, The Wealth of Nations, but he's also famous for another work, which is The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And in it, Smith gives the example of you when you make a promise. Uh, he, he says it's a promise, but Skellen is going to argue that this is more of an, of an oath than a promise. Um, so uh, Smith says that, that you are... Um, for example, uh, you make a promise to a highwayman, okay, uh, and you didn't fulfill that promise. Now, from the point of view of jurisprudence, that promise wasn't binding anyways, uh, but it has some moral weight, nonetheless. When it uh, comes to the sacred and consensuous, these are the words of, uh, of Smith, uh, they, uh, they, they have some, uh, some, moral, some moral weight. What he means is that 
Uh, no one from the police is going to come after you for not uh, fulfilling your promise to the highwayman and no one has to care about the highwayman's disappointment, but you brought on yourself some sort of dishonor, right? Um, that's because even though it is right to break a promise when this one conflicts with, uh, let's say, higher and sacred, uh, and sacred duties, like maybe you did have good reasons not to fulfill your promise to the highwayman. You promised the guy a nickel and he really needed it, but then something more important came up and you had to use that money, whatever. For Smith, you may have avoided committing a bigger harm, but what you did to the highwayman is still wrong and it is shameful. Uh, it's kind of like uh, Kant, who uh, says that when you lie to a murderer, you avoided a bigger harm, but you still did something wrong. Uh, well, here, it's the same thing. To quote Smith from Scanlon, I mean, it's Scanlon who's quoting, uh, quoting uh, Adam Smith. Whenever such promises are violated, though for the most necessary uh, reasons, it is always with some degree of dishonor for the person who made them. After they are made, we may be convinced of the uh, impro uh, impropriety of absorbing them, but there is still some fault in having made them. It is at least a departure from the highest and noblest maxims of magnanimity and honor. A brave man ought to die rather than make a promise which he can uh, neither keep uh, without folly nor violate without ignominy. Uh, ignominy. So here Smith argues that there are things that bring, uh, that bring such a dishonor, uh, a dishonor on you that it's better to die than to do them. And he considers breaking a promise as one of those things because, quote, fidelity is so uh, necessary a virtue that we apprehend it in general to be due even to those to whom nothing else is due and whom we think it uh, lawful to kill and destroy. Now, uh, all of this is at odds with uh, what Scanlon was describing about promises and like I said the reason for that is that Smith is using the word promise but he is actually talking about oaths here like he makes fidelity such a necessary virtue that it's better to die than to break your fidelity and that would make uh, promises unconditional or absolute uh, that, that wouldn't work for promises, but it will work for oaths. With oaths, you uh, swear on something that has the value, uh, that has the same value as fidelity has for Adam Smith. So to go back to our IRA example, when you consider the Bible in the way that Smith is talking about fidelity and you swear on it, well, then it's kind of game over. The dishonor and shame that you bring to yourself would be, uh, would be unbearable, let's say. As Christians, uh, once you swear on the Bible, you cannot come, uh, come, back, uh, come back from that. So oaths uh, work differently uh, than, than promises. Uh, they work differently from promises. And that is because, as Canon says, the binding force of an oath derives from the value that it is invoked in making it rather than from the uh, principles that no one could reasonably reject. So. When you make an oath, reasons for why you didn't keep your words uh, simply don't apply anymore. Whereas in the case of promises, as long as you can provide special justifications, you cannot be blamed for breaking a promise. If your, uh, your reasons for breaking a promise was that you were coerced into making uh, that promise, uh, would reject principle F to apply to you. Uh, whatever reason you have for breaking an oath, you would not say, uh, uh, I mean, uh, whatever reasons you have to break an oath, those reasons will not save you uh, because an oath is derived from something that is so valuable that it overrules anything else. And that's kind of the point of an oath. Okay. So for the minister, uh, for the minister of the Protestants, once they did make an oath on the Bible, it's over for them. They can't tell the police about the IRA, uh, what they should have done, according to the minister, is to refuse the oath in the first place. But having accepted it, it shows their weakness of will and breaking the oath would, show, uh, would only show a further weakness that is incompatible with their faith and the value of the Bible. So, to conclude, we've seen that promises don't need to rely on social practice to be binding since their obligations arise from morality about what we owe to each other. So it's about reasons and principles that we cannot uh, reject on reasonable grounds and we've shown how these are 
independent from social practices. The role of social uh, practices in all of this is just to facilitate the agreements uh, involved in promise making, but they don't give it uh, its uh, moral, uh, moral force. What gives promises their moral force are principles that forbid that we, uh, that we mislead others to form expectations that we will not fulfill if those expectations indicate that the promisee will suffer some loss if those expectations uh, are not uh, fulfilled. We've also explained in what circumstances promises are not binding and what distinguishes the obligations that come from promises from others that come from practices uh, that also involve misleading others like leading and taking oaths. Uh, but the most important thing is that when we say that uh, promises don't rely on social practices, what we have in mind is a, dis a discussion that often comes up in ethical discussions, and that is the issue of relativism, which we will discuss next time in the final chapter of the book. We're almost, uh, we're almost there, and uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you for uh, for watching. I will see you.